Good morning, and welcome to this morning AM service uh, online of worship, the worship service of Grace Baptist Church in Chambersburg, Pennsylvania. Today is a day in our country when we honor mothers, and it's good and proper to honor and thank God for godly mothers. Proverbs 31 says of the woman who fears the Lord, she opens her mouth with wisdom and the teaching of kindness is on her tongue. She looks well to the ways of her household and does not eat the bread of idleness. Her children rise up and call her blessed, her husband also, and he praises her. Many women have done excellently, but you surpass them all. Charm is deceitful and beauty is vain, but a woman who fears the Lord is to be praised. Give her of the fruit of her hands and let her works praise her in the gates. So we will seek by God's grace to honor mothers. We will later especially give thanks to God for godly mothers and uh, pray for them as well. Let us now worship God. The prophet Isaiah says in chapter 45, 18 and following, For thus says the Lord who created the heavens, He is God, who formed the earth and made it, He established it, He did not create it empty, He formed it to be inhabited. I am the Lord, and there is no other. I did not speak in secret in a land of darkness. I did not say to the offspring of Jacob, seek me in vain. I, the Lord, speak the truth. I declare what is right. Assemble yourselves and come. Draw near together, you survivors of the nations. They have no knowledge who carry about their wooden idols and keep on praying to a God that cannot save. Declare and present your case. Let them take counsel together. Who told this long ago? Who declared it of old? Was it not I, the Lord? And there is no other God besides me. A righteous God and a Savior, there is none besides me. Turn to me and be saved, all the ends of the earth. For I am God and there is no other. By myself I have sworn, from my mouth has gone out in righteousness a word that shall not return. To me every knee shall bow and every tongue shall swear allegiance. Well, this is the God whom we've come to worship this morning. May he help us. May he bless us by drawing near as we seek to draw near to him. Let's begin then with a word of prayer. Our gracious God, again, we do thank you that you have made yourself known to us. We thank you for your glory as this passage speaks of how glorious you are, a God who speaks nothing but the truth, a God who created everything that is and sustains it by the very word of your power, a God who is not only a creator but a redeemer, a God who has shown such amazing love in the giving of your own son, Jesus Christ, to die for sinners that we and him might have new life and life everlasting. How we thank you, O God, that you desire this relationship with us. We need you desperately, but you don't need us at all. And so we are grateful that you are willing to have fellowship with us. And that's what we would desire even during this time together now. We would desire fellowship with you. We would know the working of your Holy Spirit in our hearts and minds. We would draw near to you with faith and we would desire to hear from you from your word. So we come to you in all our need and we look to you in all your sufficiency. And we pray in Jesus' name, amen. This time we'll sing together hymn number 73 and the hymns modern and ancient, Let the Earth Resound.
Now, if you'll turn in God's word, please, to Revelation chapter 21. Revelation chapter 21. This is a passage uh, that is a parallel passage to the text that we'll be looking at in a few moments, but it certainly informs uh, our understanding, especially of this topic of the new heaven and the new earth. So follow along as I read Revelation chapter 21. We'll be reading the first eight verses. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and the sea was no more. I saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne, saying, Behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. He will dwell with them, and they will be his people, and God himself will be with them as their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes, and death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning, nor crying, nor pain any more, for the former things have passed away. And he who was seated on the throne said, Behold, I am making all things new. Also he said, Write this down, for these words are trustworthy and true. And he said to me, It is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. To the thirsty I will give from the spring of the water of life without payment. The one who conquers will have this heritage, and I will be his God, and he will be my son. But as for the cowardly, the faithless, the detestable, as for murderers, the sexually immoral, sorcerers, idolaters, and all liars, their portion will be in the lake that burns with fire and sulfur, which is the second death. Well, this is God's word. God speaks to us about things future as well as things present. And we would do well to listen to and take heed to his word. At this time, we'll join our hearts together once again in prayer. Let's pray. Our gracious God, again, we thank you for your word. And this passage we've just read together, you have provided for us so well in our earthly life. And we are thankful for the abundance of mercy that we receive from your hand. We are well provided in every way. And we desire, O God, to give you thanks, to trace every single blessing in our life back to your hand as the giver of every good and perfect gift. We thank you, O God, that you care for us not only in this life, but you have spoken to us of a a life to come. You have told us of things beyond the grave. You have told us of a future home that awaits your children place where you will be there with them as our God. You will be among us, and we will never be separated from your presence. And we, without sin in our hearts and in bodies that are suited to your presence, we will dwell forever as your people, enjoying you, worshiping, and serving you. So we praise you, O God, that you have established this for us, all ours, not because of anything we have done, but all because of your Son, Jesus Christ. And so we give you thanks in him. We thank you for the human family and all that it means to us. You're good to us in establishing the home, father and mother together, established in a commitment that is lifelong, raising children and desiring those children not only good in this world, but also in the world to come. And so we thank you for godly parents and especially godly mothers. And we pray for them knowing that they face many difficulties within uh, their home, knowing that every mother is a sinner, as is every father. And so a household is not a perfect place. And so we would ask your grace to be uh, poured out in abundance upon godly mothers. Pray, Father, that you will bless them, give them wisdom, help them to know you and to walk with you and to have your grace in their hearts so that they might speak with grace to children, that they might Uh, love and care for children in a manner that is Christ-like and gracious. We thank you for the high calling of motherhood in a world that uh, despises motherhood or sees it as a a uh, sub-activity, not worthy of a woman's full attention. And we thank you, O God, that you have established the godly mother within the home and all of its purpose, all of the good that it is is intended for children and their uh, growing up. We thank you, Father, for your wisdom in ordering all things, and we pray that you will help us in our homes 
to honor you, that Christ may be loved and central your word, the uh, continual compass and guide in all of our conduct within the home. We pray for mothers as they seek to point their children to Christ, pray for their children to come to Christ. We pray that you will help them as they read Bible stories, as they live before their children and seek to teach them what it is to love and know and serve Christ. We pray that you will help them to teach even in this context of the uh, COVID-19 uh, virus, to teach children what it is not to live in fear in the world that you have created and yet to recognize still uh, that in these things they can trust in you and rest in you, that there is salvation, that there is a God who loves and a God who hears and answers prayer, uh, that they may learn themselves to turn to you in all their circumstances and to find your peace reigning within their hearts. We pray for mothers who are tired and stressed again during this time when children, school-aged children are now home full-time. We pray that you will give them grace, that you will help them to have patience and to have love expressed in the way that they speak to the children, and that you will help them when they are frustrated to turn to you. We pray for working mothers who must risk contacting the virus outside of the home and bringing it back into the home. We pray that you will protect our homes from this virus. We pray for mothers who have adult children now grown uh, out of the home, having families of their own and yet far from God. We pray, O oh God, that you will hear mothers' prayers for these children, that you will have mercy and save these children, bring them to Christ, that they may know and love him supremely and above all. We pray for adult children who are caring for their own mothers in old age, and all of the unique difficulties of this. Pray that you will help them to honor mother and to know what that looks like and that you will give much grace again. And where there are mothers who are not believers, we pray that you will be merciful and save them. Even if they are at the end of life, we know that your saving mercies can reach them there. And we pray that you would, that you would pursue them in your grace and save them by your mercy. We pray for expectant mothers that you will protect the baby in their womb. Bring these babies to full term and in safety and uh, add to our homes these blessed gifts that are from you. And then we would pray even for our world and for the COVID-19 that it might be a, a means of causing women, perhaps single women who become pregnant, that they would um, turn away from the idea of aborting that child, that you would give them an interest, a desire to preserve the life of that little one, we pray, Father, that you will give them the courage to take on motherhood, even if it must be alone. Help them to cry out to you and to find the strength and the grace and the mercy, first salvation and then everything needful to live for your glory. Our God, we thank you for your great mercy to us. We look forward to hearing from your word and pray that you will give us hearts to embrace everything that you say and that you will help us by your spirit, not only to understand, but to put into practice your will. All this we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Once more, uh, we will turn in the hymnal and sing number 110. Uh, this uh, is a prayer, Speak, O Lord, number 110 in the hymns, Modern and Ancient. When we come to God's word, we need the help of the Holy Spirit to understand it. And so this is a prayer in which we ask the help of the Spirit for understanding and for putting into practice his word. Number 110.
Please turn again in God's Word this time to Romans chapter 8, Romans 8, and we'll be reading a section from verse 18 through 25. I'll just put a marker there. Uh, we won't read it immediately, but we'll come to it in just a few moments. On September 26, 1991, eight people entered a huge greenhouse in Arizona. This greenhouse had its own miniature grassland, rainforest, desert, and ocean. It was part of a two-year project called the Biosphere 2 Project. The purpose was to demonstrate the viability of a closed ecological system to support and maintain human life in outer space. It was to be an early test bed for life on Mars. The goal was to live in this world without any outside help eating food uh, that they grew themselves, breathing oxygen given off by the trees and water, living completely within this self-supporting system. But the experiment failed to achieve some key goals. Among other things, food and oxygen had to eventually be brought in from outside. Nevertheless, visitors to this remarkable greenhouse are still given literature that promotes the concept of a settlement on Mars. Christians have a far better expectation for the future. The Bible tells us that when the Lord Jesus returns to this earth, the world as we presently know it will pass away. According to God's promise, says Peter, we are waiting for new heavens and a new earth where the redeemed will live in God's presence forever. A place where there will be, Revelation 21 and verse 4, no tears, no death, sorrow, crying, or pain. But this will be no merely human experiment, the product of man's finite imagination. No, it is a divinely authorized and guaranteed certainty regarding the believer's eternal and heavenly home. The reason God reveals this to us in the Bible is that knowing what will happen to us when we die not only takes away fear of the future, it also fills us with hope and confidence and anticipation in the present. When fear goes and hope in God overflows, we will live differently in the present. Sometimes people scoff at Christians who are so heavenly minded they're no earthly good. But the opposite should be the case. C.S. Lewis once put it this way in Mere Christianity, if you read history, you will find that the Christians who did the most for the present world were just those who thought most of the next. It is since Christians have largely ceased to think of the other world that they have become so ineffective in this one. The Apostle Paul could say of the believers in Colossae, We always thank God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, when we pray for you, because we have heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and of the love you have for all the saints, the faith and love that spring from the hope that is stored up for you in heaven. You see what Paul says. Hope is a motivating power for love and faith in this present life. The blessed hope of seeing Jesus Christ going to be with him is a powerful force for how the Christian lives in this present world. And just consider how your children act just before Christmas or before a family vacation. How cooperative they can be. How obedient, how kind to their siblings as they hope for a rewarding Christmas day or an exciting getaway vacation. How much more should the bright promise of heaven encourage the believer's faith, love, and obedience while we live in the present life here on earth? It should motivate us to pursue a life of holiness. That's what John says in 1 John 3. 
Dear friends, now we are children of God, and what we will be has not yet been made known. But we know that when he appears, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. And then this, everyone who has this hope in him purifies himself, just as he is pure. The Apostle Peter says a similar thing. Therefore, prepare your minds for action. Be self-controlled. Set your hope fully on the grace to be given you when Jesus Christ is revealed. As obedient children, do not conform to the evil desires you had when you lived in ignorance. But just as he who called you is holy, so be holy in all you do. For it is written, be holy because I am holy. Set your hope fully, says Peter, on the grace to be given you when Jesus Christ is revealed. You see how hope is meant to fuel the way that we live in the present. The more we truly live in light of this future promised hope, the less we'll yield to the sinful pleasures of the moment. We won't be drawn in by the allure of this world. We won't devote our best energies to laying up treasures on earth. We won't set our hearts on accomplishments that ultimately fade. We won't fret over what this life fails to give us of wealth or health or fame or power. And the thought of dying won't make us sorrowful that we're losing what we love most on this earth, but rather it will fill us with sincere joy at the prospect of gaining Christ and our heavenly home. God's promise to the Christian is, behold, I am making everything new. Now, in previous weeks, we looked at what this renewal, this making everything new, would involve for his people personally on the day Jesus Christ is revealed, a heavenly home and a heavenly body. And now this morning, we want to look at another part of God's promise, what this renewal, this making of everything new will involve for the created order. And we'll be guided by two simple points. Uh, these are on your outline. First of all, what God promises. Second, the fulfillment of God's promise. What God promises and the fulfillment of God's promise. Well, first of all, then, what God promises. What does God promise regarding the future created order. He promises a new heavens and a new earth. The prophet Isaiah spoke about it in chapter 65 and verse 17. Behold, says God, I will create new heavens and a new earth. The former things will not be remembered, nor will they come to mind. John in the New Testament in Revelation 21 and verse 1, which we read moments ago. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and the sea was no more. Peter, Peter speaks about it in his second epistle, Second Peter 3, verses 10 and following. But the day of the Lord will come like a thief. The heavens will disappear with a roar, the elements will be destroyed by fire, and the earth and everything in it will be laid bare. Since everything will be destroyed in this way, what kind of people ought you to be? You ought to live holy and godly lives as you look forward to the day of God and speed its coming. That day will bring about the destruction of the heavens by fire and the elements will melt in the heat. But in keeping with his promise, we are looking forward to a new heaven and a new earth, the home of righteousness. Our great hope, if we are in Christ, for the final state of eternity is a new heaven and a new earth, the dwelling of God in which righteousness dwelt. Now, if you're listening carefully to these passages, it raises a question. When John says in Revelation 21 and verse 1, the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and when Peter three times speaks of this present earth being destroyed, do they mean that this earth that we live on and the heavens we live under will be totally done away with, and that God will start all over again from scratch and create a totally new creation. Well, to answer this, we want to consider Paul's teaching in Romans chapter 8, verses 18 and following, and I'll uh, invite you to read along with me there. Romans chapter 8, verses 18 and following. For I consider, writes Paul, that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that is to be revealed to us. For the creation, and that's the inanimate creation, the creation waits with eager longing. One translation there renders it, the creation is on tiptoe to see. 
The creation waits with eager longing for the revealing of the sons of God. For the creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it in hope that the creation itself will be set free from its bondage to corruption and obtain the freedom of the glory of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation has been groaning together in the pains of childbirth until now. Not only the creation, but we ourselves who have the first fruits of the Spirit grown inwardly as we wait eagerly for adoption as sons, the redemption of our bodies. For in this hope we are saved. Now, hope that is seen is not hope, for who hopes for what he sees? But if we hope for what we do not see, we wait for it with patience. So Paul is instructing us about things future, and he says this world is not what it was originally created to be. But the problems with the cosmos that Paul has in mind here are not those that the human race has inflicted upon it, things like pollution or destruction of various kinds. This world, says Paul, has also been subjected to troubles as a result of God's judgment on man, rendering it uh, this judgment at the time of the fall. Remember in Genesis 3, verses 17 and 18, God told Adam immediately after the fall, cursed is the ground Because of you, cursed is the ground, and it will produce thorns and thistles for you. Nature had not sinned. Adam had sinned. But nature was subjected to this downgrading because of his sin, and so entered into his judgment, resulting, as Paul says here in verses 20 and 21, futility and bondage and corruption. That's a description of life. After the fall, life in this world. So to return to our question, what does God promise? God promises a new heaven and a new earth. But what exactly does that mean? How does he intend to bring it about? And will the present universe be totally destroyed so that a new universe will be completely made new? Or will the new universe be the present universe, only renewed and purified? Well, this brings us then to our second point, and that is the fulfillment of God's promises. The fulfillment. A number of things that Paul says in these verses clearly favor the understanding that in fulfilling his promise of a new heavens and a new earth, God intends to renew and purify the present universe, not to annihilate it completely and then start all over from scratch. Paul gives at least four significant reasons for believing that will be the case, and we'll look at those briefly in turn. For one thing, letter A on your outline, there is a link with our bodies. There's a link with our bodies. It's really a question much like the one we've already considered in previous sermons concerning the redemption of our bodies, which Paul also brings into view, you notice, in verse 24. Paul, in verse 23, connects the redemption of our bodies, that is, the resurrection and restoration of our bodies, after a lifetime of groaning, with, verse 23, the restoration of the creation. Look at it again. And not only the creation, but we ourselves, who have the first fruits of the Spirit, groan inwardly as we wait eagerly for adoption as sons, the redemption of our bodies. Our bodies are part of this present creation. What happens to our bodies and what happens to creation go together. And notice, and here's the point, what happens to our bodies is not annihilation, but redemption, transformation. Some have called it transfiguration. We await, Paul says in verse 23, the redemption of our bodies, by which he means the resurrection of our bodies. Remember those previous passages that talk about how we will be changed, we will be transformed. We saw that there would be in our last message, there will be continuity between our present and our future resurrection bodies. They will be the same bodies that are planted in the ground, but there will also be discontinuity. That is, our bodies will be different. They will be heavenly. They will be glorified. And so too, it seems here, Paul is saying a similar thing. Creation will experience something like that too. A resurrection with continuity and discontinuity. 
So we shouldn't expect the present universe to be completely annihilated because there is a link with our bodies. That's letter A. And then letter B, another reason. And that's the fact that Paul speaks in verse 20 of a subjection in hope. A subjection in hope. Looking at verse 19, Paul there pictures the present creation, the present one. Not some totally different creation, but the present one has eager longings. Something is coming that makes creation, as it were, stand on tiptoe. It's like a child stands on tiptoe hoping to cap capture the first glimpse of a parade float that's coming down the street. and The little one is on his tiptoes looking to see, to catch a glimpse, knowing that something good is about to arrive. And then verse 20 gives part of the reason why creation is so full of longing and expectation, namely because the futility of creation, all the decay and disaster, the disease and the pain, they are part of that temporary curse God put on this creation. Indeed, God did not curse the creation with frustration as his final word. No, Paul says in verse 20, he did it in hope. That is in hope of something future. In hope of what? Verse 21, the creation itself will be set free from its bondage to corruption and obtain the freedom of the glory of the children of God. In other words, the creation isn't destined for annihilation. It is destined for liberation, to be set free from bondage to decay. Rather than the present earth and heavens going out of existence, Paul says they will be set free from corruption. The frustration will be destroyed. The bondage to decay will be consumed in the purifying, liberating fire of God's judgment. But the earth itself will remain. And there'll be no more corruption, no more futility, no more crying or death or pain. So we shouldn't expect the present universe to be completely annihilated because it was subjected in hope. And then let her see. Another reason is the fact that Paul speaks in verse 22 of an expectant groaning. Let her see an expectant groaning. Paul says the present earth is in labor pains. Verse 22, we know that the whole creation has been groaning as in the pains of childbirth right up to the present time. The upheavals of creation, says Paul, are like labor pains during the last stages of pregnancy. In other words, something is about to be brought forth from creation, not in place of creation. Do you see that? It's from creation, not in place of creation. The earth is going to bring forth, like a mother in labor, through the upheavals of fire and earthquake, a new earth. Now, you'll remember that Jesus used the same imagery of labor pains. First in Matthew 24, verses 7 and 8. For nation will rise up against nation and kingdom against kingdom. And in various places there will be famines and earthquakes. But all these things are merely the beginning of birth pangs. There it is, birth pangs. Later in the upper room, he comforted his disciples saying, I tell you the truth. You will weep and mourn while the wor world rejoices. You will grieve, but your grief will turn to joy. A woman giving birth to a child has pain because her time has come. But when her baby is born, she forgets the anguish because of her joy that a child is born into the world. So with you. Now is your time of grief, but I will see you again and you will rejoice and no one will take away your joy. You see, it's a very important analogy because it points beyond the cause of grief to its joyful consummation. While the pains of childbirth, as any mother could attest, are real and severe, yet they are not endless. They last only for a time, nor are they hopeless. On the contrary, they are filled with joyful expectation. They're not endless and they're not hopeless. Since under normal circumstances, the climax of that birth is the arrival of a little child. And so this earth, says Paul, is like 
a mother about to give birth to a new earth where righteousness dwells and where God reigns in the midst of his people. So there is groaning, but it is expectant groaning in expectation of a safe delivery. And it looks forward to a time when all that is causing pain presently will be removed and salvation will be gloriously consummated. It's an expectant groaning. And then a final reason, letter D. Final reason we shouldn't expect the present universe to be completely annihilated is Paul's language of a glorious renewal. A glorious renewal. Now, when the New Testament writers spoke of something as being new, that word new in the New Testament, they had a choice between two Greek words, neos and kainos. Neos, the first Greek word, means new with respect to time, something that wasn't there before, something completely novel. We've grown used to that word novel, haven't we, in our day. COVID-19 is described as a novel virus. That's neos. It's brand new, didn't previously exist. It's only just now appearing, neos. The second Greek word for new is kainos. It means of a kind character or quality, a new kind character or quality in contrast to what previously existed. In other words, it's different in nature from the old. It's superior to what was before. And it is that second Greek word, kainos, that the New Testament writers use with regard to this new universe. In other words, When John speaks about a new heaven and a new earth, he didn't mean new in time, brand new, novel, something that didn't previously exist. Rather, it is a renewed, a transfigured, a transformed heaven and earth. It's of a different kind and character and quality from the old heaven and earth. It is different in nature and superior to what was before. A glorious renewal, do you see? This is the way the Bible speaks of the new creation, the new heavens and the new earth. And so while at the end of this age, there will be cataclysmic events that will bring this age and this world to an end as we know it now, that will bring about the end of things as normal, we would say, but it will not put this world out of existence. It will not. Rather, just like a farmer will sometimes, you've seen in this area, perhaps the stubble in a field will be uh, lit on fire and they'll burn the stubble off of the top of the field in order to prepare it to plant a new crop. So too, God will wipe out from this world all that is evil. He will cleanse this world, as it were, by fire, thus fitting it for an age of glory and righteousness and peace that will never end. That is will be the believer's final habitation. A new earth, this earth, but made new. Creation will, as it were, be born again, freed from its slavery to corruption and decay and futility, changed into a place that is perfectly suited for the perfect and glorious children of God. Thanks be to God for his word, this description of what awaits the Christian in the future. Thinking about the joys of a new heaven and a new earth moved Thomas Brown. He was a renowned 17th century English physician. Thomas Brown wrote this. When we begin to talk about life after death, we're like two infants in a womb discussing the nature of their future life. The difference between our present knowledge and understanding of what it will be uh, to share God's glory is no less great than what exists between unborn babies and a man in the strength of his days. As Christians, we know it is indescribable, and thus we can rejoice, but it will be even greater than our wildest imaginations. We can't predict. Even when we're thinking about, it's the same thing with the resurrection body. You look at a seed, and looking at the seed alone, you cannot predict what the body might look like. And in the same way, we cannot know exactly, and all that will be true, of this new creation, this new world that God is making for his people. It's a heaven, you see, for his people. One writer has said that heaven is what Christianity is all about. Without heaven, 
it's all to no purpose. The covenant of redemption, the incarnation, the cross, the resurrection, it's all about how God brings us to himself and to heaven ultimately. Heaven stands at the end of it all as that towards which everything points, from which everything derives its meaning. There is, says Scripture, a heavenly city that awaits every believer with golden streets and clear flowing river and the Lamb who is all the glory of that place. There is the Father's house. It is our eternal home if we're in Christ. A home we will never again have to leave. A home where we will truly belong. A home where there will be no tears, no death, no sorrow, no crying, no pain. A home that will be everything a home should be, much more than the best of our homes here has ever been. And best of all, this will be no merely human experiment, the product of man's finite imagination. No, it is a divinely authorized, guaranteed certainty for the child of God. If you are in Christ, let your mind take in and meditate on and ponder these descriptions God has given you in his word. They're intended to change the way we live in the present. Hope-filled lives will change, transform the way that we view everything about this world and expectation of what awaits us in heaven. It will bring encouragement. It will strengthen you in the present. Remember, Paul says, Encourage one another with these words. Whether it's in life's darkest moments or most joyous moments, never forget, Christian, that the best is yet to be. And if you're not in Christ, may God grant you today to taste and see that the Lord is good and to give you a hunger and a thirst for Jesus Christ, his righteousness by which alone you can be justified before God, have peace with God, the one only who can bring you to himself and to heaven. Look to the Lord Jesus Christ and live. Let's pray together. Our gracious God, how we thank you for your mercies to us. These descriptions are, um, they defy our imagination trying to understand what they mean. You haven't revealed everything that there is to know. Though one day we will know, we will see, and we will understand all that you have promised now. But you have given us plenty to meditate on and to fuel our hope. And we pray that it may have that effect, that we will live hope-filled lives in the present. That we will, having this hope, uh, seek to be pure and holy even as you are. Uh, that you will help us to live differently. And in a world where many people, even in our day, this present day, when people are filled with fear, some are given over to hopelessness. Uh, many can see no reason for moving on. Uh, and they're looking to the government to provide what it never can. But we thank you that you have given true hope, lasting hope. Uh, hope that will never uh, fall short for all who trust in your son. So we pray, Father, that those of us who are in Christ may speak often, pointing people to Jesus Christ and the hope that they may have in him, salvation, forgiveness of sins, new life, and life everlasting. And you, we pray that you would work by your spirit through the gospel preached today all around the world to change hearts and minds and lives forever, that people may have a, a hope while they live and even when they die, an eternal hope in Jesus Christ. All this we pray in his name. Amen. Before we close, we'll sing together another hymn. This is also from the Hymns Modern and Ancient, number 29, Creation Sings the Father's Song. No
Now let's pray together. Our gracious God, how we thank you again for your word and for the encouragements you give us. We thank you that these are not just the expressions of wishful thinking on the part of different individuals throughout history, but trying to stir up some kind of reason to have hope in an, in an ultimately hopeless world. Rather, they are the expressions of the one who created all things, the one uh, who does know the end from the beginning and all things are unfolding, and these promises you are able to make because you are able to bring them to pass. And so we pray that you will help us to trust and rest in you, in your, in your truth, in your word. Give us hearts that see our need of Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord. Give us a complete hope in him for forgiveness and for everything else which he alone can give. And give us a hope of heaven in him, that we might look beyond the things of this day, that we might recognize that you are in control even of the smallest virus, the smallest thing that escapes the human eye and defies the scientist's best understanding of that you are in control of all things and that we can rest and trust in you for time and forever. Give us hearts that trust in you. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Therefore, my brothers, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that in the Lord your labor is not in vain.